So Ryan, what was your path into audio? Like, you're, you're a kid, you know, okay, you love music, you play music, but how did that lead into engineering? The thing I noticed is that I, there were, there were records that I knew were good bands, but I didn't, they didn't sound good to me, and then I, didn't, I couldn't listen to those records. But I acknowledged that the bands were really good. And I thought, well, that's weird. And I remember looking at, at records and looking, I was always looking for who the producer was and who the engineer was. At, as a young kid, I don't know why that was, but that was interesting to me. And, the, and back when they, they were big pictures and big records, there were pictures of studios and they put pictures of the sessions. And I just thought that looked so cool. And I used to just blast music on, the, on my hi-fi and I just used to like, and they had the bass and the treble control. I used to love doing that and I found an old reel-to-reel -reel machine in, my da in the basement that was my dad's. And he had two of them and I would bounce between them and do overdubs with microphones and I tried to build an electric guitar. <laughs> like I did all sorts of crazy stuff and I built my first studio in the basement when I was 12, I think. Yeah. That's pretty young. Pretty young. I got, a, I got up enough money to buy a cassette four track for mowing lawns. And uh, for, for Christmas, my parents would buy me like a microphone or a mic stand. And that went on, you know, f through all those years. But sound, the sound part of it was the only, uh, that was the part I cared the most about. I don't know why. It just was, it was just in there. I just kind of, I just liked sound and I liked the way, I liked the way the sound made me feel. It was all, it was like, for me, it was, the emotion was all in the sound. And so your experience when you were starting to record yourself, your own stuff, were you able to connect like what you liked and it sounded good or were you like, this isn't sounding the way I want, so how do I make it sound better? How do I? Yeah, well, there was a lot of that. A lot of it was that because with just those limited tools, you had to, figure it all out right. so you were like it wasn't like nowadays i wonder about that nowadays because everything's so easy people are i mean people send me stuff they have you know 27 1176s on them i go like okay well that's a lot of stuff but like all i had was maybe one or two microphones and you could only do you'd have to do three tracks and then bounce those to a track and then do two tracks and bounce those to a track so you could get that many tracks uh but you had to be really innovative you had to figure out where to put the mic, and you had to figure, if you wanted it to be distorted, you had to actually distort it with the mic gain. And if you wanted it to be sound far away, you actually had to like record it from far away, or or process what you had already recorded and reamp it like in a bathroom or something. So the whole thing became this like sound became experimental. And I think in doing that, I learned a lot about how microphones pick up sound and where to put them. And if you point them in certain directions, you get different effects. And that all came from, from those early years of only having a few pieces of gear. And so you figured that all out on your own or was there any kind of other source of information on how to do this? Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the four track came with a manual. <laughs> <laughs> and I always joke every once in a while, I get caught where it's something, uh, it happened on this last session where the, uh, I had set up all the mics, but I had forgotten to set up the, uh, one of the mics on the guitar amps because they were in this closet thing and I hadn't, I for, and I'm listening to them, I'm like, why does this guitar sound so weird? And I go out and I look and I joke to everyone, I was like, yeah, you know, they, they teach you this, and engineers, they teach you this, like point the microphone at the instrument as like step number one. So there, you do learn things like that. Like, right. like if you want it to sound like the instrument, like point the microphone at the instrument, but sometimes, you know, but where exactly you point it at the instrument and more importantly, what exactly the microphone you're using becomes to me where it's an art form. That's where uh, a lot of engineering seems like it's gotten to this thing where um, it's just like capturing sound. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily like thinking about how those sounds translate. A lot of people doing them themselves kind of think like, well, if it gets into the computer and it's recorded fairly well, then a mix engineer or a mastering engineer or somebody can work with it. And that, that is kind of true. Right. But for me, that misses the point of what the art form is of like trying to like, uh, I don't know, just think about like how, like it's not just an acoustic guitar. It's like, you got to think about how for that record, how that guitar should sound and what kind of vibe you're going for and what the overall idea of the sonics of the project are. It's not just like this idea of just sterilely recording a, an instrument is weird to me. I never, uh, would have been interested in engineering if that was the case. When did you start like integrating digital into what you were learning and recording? And 
it started when I was in college, basically. They came out with what was originally called Sound Tools. It was a two-channel program that just was basically designed for digital stereo editing of things. Um, and it was weird. It had a weird interfacing where, like, if you had a song that you put, you put in there and you were like, and you wanted to chop the, chop half of the bridge out to make the song shorter, you had to tell the program that you, you're like, okay, I want to keep from the beginning of the song to the halfway point of the bridge, and then I want to keep from the end of the bridge to the end of the song, and then it would go, whoop. And I always thought, like, why is it, why am I having to tell it the parts I want to keep? Right. Like, why can't I tell it the part I want to delete? Uh, so that's how it started. And then after that, a year or two later, it became a four-channel Pro Tools system, right. and then an eight, and then it was, by the time I got to, um, out of college, I think it was a, I think it was up to a 16-channel system, um, which is weird to think about. It was, I mean, it was maxed out. When they finally got the 24 channels, everyone was like, oh my God, it's the same as a tape machine. Right. But now look at it, it's like, it's uh, basically unlimited channels. And what did you do after college? You went to Memphis? Yeah. Okay. Got my first gig in Memphis. First session was Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, started off as a runner, answering phones. And the whole time I was there, uh, I just read everything I could. I, I learned about, because I hadn't I worked on an SSL before. And the automation system on them is a little, a, a little specific, so I had to learn that. And I just, so I just, I read all the manuals, I read all the stuff. Um, I used every minute I could to get better at doing it. Uh, and I, I, I kind of started getting into the rooms a little bit more and started getting, uh, doing more sessions as, as a second. And then uh, I heard through the grapevine that Bob Clearmountain was looking for a new second engineer, and he knew my boss at the time and talked to him and he's like, oh, we just got this great guy, Ryan, from this school in Northern California. You should talk to the school and get something from there because he's been great. And uh, so they were talking to friends of mine and I heard about it. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, man, I want that job. Like nothing against Memphis, but I was, I'm from California and I was like, man, I gotta, I, I, if I could get back to California, right. Bob works in uh, Los Angeles. And I was like, that'd be great. So I, uh, I don't know, I can't remember how I got his number, but I got his number and I cold called him. And he, he, he kind of knew who I was because he had, my boss had mentioned me to him. Uh, and I don't think we had more than a 10 minute conversation. I was, I was, but I was pretty blunt. I was like, you know, I'd really like, I've heard you're looking for somebody. I'd really like the job. I, I was like, I love it here, but I'd really like to get back to California. And, uh, you know, I hoped, you know, I'd like to be considered for the, for the gig. And he was like, yeah, well, let me talk to, you know, Betty about it and his wife and uh, let me, you know, let me think about it. And I was like, okay. So then I put the phone down and a week went by and I didn't hear anything. And I was like, man, I did not get that gig. I was like, if I didn't get that gig, I need, I need somebody to tell me I didn't get that gig right. because that's, I just can't, I can't live in this weird thing. So a week later I called him and uh, he said, hey, yeah, uh, when, when are you getting here? Uh, we start Springsteen uh, on, on this date. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> so I got the job. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, I gave notice, I gave a week's notice and I packed my car back up and I drove back to LA, to Oakland first to see my folks and then drove down to LA and they were, everyone was like, uh, uh, well, where's the studio? Where are you working? I'm like, I, I don't know. It's in Los Angeles somewhere. Well, how much is he paying? He's like, I have no idea. We didn't, didn't talk about that. Like, what are you doing? You quit your job and you're driving to LA to work at a place you don't know where it is and you don't know how much they're going to pay you. Right. I was like, yep. It wasn't even a question in my mind. It was like somebody, told, uh, just, it was just like, how much is he paying me? Right. Like, what kind of, that, what a weird question. Like, I never would consider even thinking of that question. It's like, I, I'm talking to Bob Clearmount. Like, I'm asking him for a job. He said, yes. <laughs> done. done. <laughs> no other questions need to be asked. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I came down here and I worked for him for, uh, for three years. It was amazing. And uh, that was the beginning of it. Right. Went independent and uh, uh, starved for about 10 years and did okay for another 10 years and maybe go back to starving a little bit here and there, but you know, you keep, you keep uh, plugging away and. Us engineers are always in that perpetual state of maybe they will stop calling. Yeah. yeah. Well, it also happens with your work too, where you're like, there's, you'll feel really good about it and then you'll, like you hear it somewhere in a weird way, like even like at the grocery store, some weird thing, or you're like, is that, 
I mixed that. I don't know if that sounds so good. And you're like, oh, man, I suck. <laughs> and then sometimes it's just because it was a weird playback system, or sometimes maybe you did suck on that particular record. But you always try to do your best every time. That's the other thing that really comes in handy. If you give it your absolute all every time, you never have to it, – it's easier to not be depressed. Because right. if somebody doesn't like it, you're like, well, I gave, I gave it everything I had. Having such a, a very full background in analog, do you think that helped you um, when you started learning about digital and transitioning to using digital workstations? Uh, do you think that it helps you approach working in digital from a different place? Yeah, I guess the thing I was thinking of when you were talking about that is the, um, to me the transition, it was just a, uh, it was just a playback system change. It wasn't a, um, a, a technique change necessarily. Right. Like at first it was just like, instead of going to tape, you would just go to, to a, a workstation. And that in a lot of ways was easier than going to tape and then transferring to a workstation. The thing I never liked is that uh, if you were making a record on analog, everybody felt like they were listening to the speakers and listening to the console and listening to what you were doing. And as soon as you transferred it into the computer, everyone would turn their heads and look at the computer screen. Right. That would drive me crazy. And the other shift that I like is that because uh, digital is a li for, for me is more um, uh, faithful to what you're trying to capture in a lot of ways, at least modern digital where the converter, if you're using good converters and all that stuff that you can, when you hear the sound of the mic and you hear the sound of how you're hitting the compressor and all the things that you're doing, it pretty much comes back to you that way. And I always think of that on analog, there were all sorts of things, you, uh, there was all this kind of guesswork. You had to kind of guesswork at like, like how hard you were hitting it. And it had to kind of guesswork like the high frequency roll off that might happen a little bit or the bass boost that might happen on certain things. You had to kind of, you had to be experienced and kind of guess and you don't have to guess as much uh, in digital. So I like that. And you get to record things in different ways. Like I love ribbon microphones and I love dark microphones. Mm -hmm. But I love them because I'm recording them to a digital playback in Pro Tools, and I can, I if I I don't know if I would do that to analog. I don't know if I would do so much dark ribbon mic stuff because when you do that on the digital, like a dark mic on a kick drum to analog tape just starts to it's too much, and I really like combining things. So I like like I'll put a I'll put a dark mic and then kind of a bright compressor going into Pro Tools, and that kind of balances me, or I'll do like I'll do shifty things where I'll put like, I'll put a brightish mic near the dark part of the instrument and a dark mic near the bright part of the instrument. And, and maybe if, even if they're right very close to each other, you still get kind of both of those kind of flavors and they kind of automatically balance each other. And that, I kind of like that kind of um, approach to recording. And I, I try to keep everything kind of uniform. So if you wanted to bring like the entire stereo bus, if you wanted to brighten the whole thing up, not it wouldn't, it would work because not, there's not like one really bright thing. Right. It's like, it's all kind of within a certain range of, of bright to dark. And uh, so you can brighten everything up and have it all just be even, but just a little brighter. Right. So you can, can you, because of that, you can record more darkly, right. I guess is what I'm saying. Well, that really kind of ties in and, and speaks back to what you said earlier about always having the idea that how you capture it and that's just the first step and the most important thing to consider. Well, that, and I think to talk about that is, that's where I think a lot of things are missing, especially as if I'm just sent stuff to mix. Mm -hmm. And I think you, we've talked about this too, where you, you get the mixes of stuff and you think about what the intention was and why they made those choices. And I do that as a mix engineer with th things I don't record. And it'll bite you sometimes because people will send stuff and they want it to sound they expect you to do something completely different with it than how they recorded it. Right. And to me, that makes no sense. Like, why would you record it this way if this wasn't how you intended it to be? Well, or you get that thing that we had recently, I'm not naming names, but where it's like, like people use reference things and it's great. Like I, I'm not saying people shouldn't use reference thing, but when, when somebody says like, oh, I really want this record to sound like this, mm -hmm. it kind of misses the whole point because our job is to react to everything that's, happening right. and if it's not supposed it, it's probably not supposed to sound like another record Absolutely. it's supposed to sound like this record this is the record it's supposed to sound yeah, like yeah. and as soon as you try and start ripping it apart because it's I went through years I remember some of the I, some of the early stuff I was doing with Joe Henry was like that where 
I remember just like killing myself, like trying to, I was like, I got to make this like into this and I got, and I would just fight it and fight it and fight it. And then after, after days, it'll be like, oh man, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop fighting. Right. And I would just go with it. And it was so much better. And the weird thing is, uh, when I listen back, like the stuff I did 10, 15 years ago, and I remember being in that struggle, like trying to, uh, like I still hadn't really, uh, hadn't really come to terms with what kind of, who I was or, or I was still trying to imitate other things or I'd be like oh that record's got that really cool thing let me put that on this record and I went through years of that and now I listen to those and I go like wow that that guy was on to some really cool stuff I but I remember it being a real struggle at the time right. but as soon as I let go of trying to imitate and I think that's where the recognition helps with that because when people mm -hmm. recognize and go like hey man I really like what you did on that record you go like okay well it's it's validating. You go like, well, I, you know, I can, you know, I'll just keep doing my thing. Trust your instincts. It's there's nothing that's more exciting than than being able, having that opportunity to just serve the mix, or yeah. it, you know, and go wherever it takes you instead of trying to fit it into the box of be like this. Yeah. Oh, and here's the other thing about that that I've been running into lately too. That's driving me crazy is allowing allowing randomness to happen, right. especially people. I don't know where they get this idea, but if people are starting to smooth out all the random weird stuff that happens in the studio. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they think that. Like the random stuff is usually the best right. parts of what happened. Yeah. And there was like one thing we just did where there was this, I don't know, it was like on the fade out and the keyboard player, like I don't know what he did, but it was right. this loud keyboard thing came on. And I, it was, I don't know why, I just loved it. Right. It was a mistake. I don't think the, the guy didn't mean to play it. It was really loud. Mm -hmm. It made no sense to have this loud thing happen during the fade out. Right. But I thought it was really cool. Right. And then he had me mellow it out. And it was like, why, like, why are you, why are you, it's, and I think what happens, especially with like earbuds and stuff, people listen really loud on earbuds mm -hmm. and anything that's pokey or offensive, right. they just go, whoa. Like, so, yeah. and, I, and as a mixer, that's the stuff I love. I don't want it to hurt, but I also like, I like when thing, you go like, well, what, what the heck was that? Right. And especially growing up like I did listening to 70s records where they're all, they're all live mixes. It's all, it's, right. There's no automation for the most part. And so stuff's panning or levels are changing. It's because somebody's grabbing knobs and doing it. And you never get it perfect. It's always got some weird thing where you're like, oh, wow, it's weird that, the, it, that you didn't quite get that last pan right. But it's magical and it's human and it's fun. And those are the... That random element, I think, is the other part that we're in danger of losing because you can, you can control everything. Right. So because you can control everything, you feel like you should control everything. Right. There were de we had decades like that with pitch. I can see where the pitch is supposed to be, therefore I must put the pitch there, and it misses the entire point of pitch in music. Well, and feeling like there's a right and a wrong, and, and yeah. to a certain extent there is, but... You know, when you focus too much on the right and the wrong, again, you know, you just kind of lose sight of serving, you know, the music that you're making. Yeah, exactly. So you use a lot of analog gear, but how do you integrate digital and analog in your setup and how you work? Well, I guess it started with uh, ease of use idea because people expect quick recalls. And uh, so that's kind of where it began, where you're like, if you... If you do all analog, you get swamped down with recall notes and all this. So it became pretty apparent that you were going to get exhausted if you right. kept that path. So basically what I, my hybrid setup is uh, analog summing with the Sigma, which does analog fader rides. Mm -hmm. So all the fader rides are in a VCA automated mode, the way like old school mode, which is very different. It's a much kind of like gooier automation rides and it's not as jerky and then and then you do two bus processing to, to flavor you do some eq some compression some high frequency limiting and then uh you add st stereo two boxes like the p331 <laughs> and you print to tape uh -huh. and even if you don't print the tape you run through the you run through the tape heads and that adds like a little that messes with the crosstalk a little bit right. and all these things are possible in the box but they just don't i don't know they I, I had the thought the times I was trying to mix just in the box, I was like, you know, I, I was like sonically, I'm like, I'm not, I wasn't angry at any of it sonically. I just, I was just like, it just doesn't, I, I would just need to do this. I would need to do that for 25 years right. to really understand how 
all those things interact because in the analog world they the all the plugins like kind of sound similar but they don't they don't uh react to each other the same way like i remember when i first tried it i i, I just bought all the plugins that were all the analog stuff and i toned them all out and i got it all set it exactly the same way and i was like this doesn't sound anything like the way the my mix sounds using the analog stuff right. so i just was like well i'll leave it to other people to do that but i do i do keep all the all the mo the analog stuff is in the summing and on the two bus all the per channel stuff is all plugins right. so all you have to basically do is recall the analog two bus which is a much simpler process per you can get it you know mo it never changes really per mix right. so that that gets you the recallability while maintaining the sound i like without um doing it i always laugh like i've gotten my mix rig down much smaller than it used to be three huge flight cases and now it's much smaller right. but i always laugh when i think about it because there's people doing it on a laptop with a pair of headphones right well convenience i think it's really interesting i had a conversation with someone else about how you know, the difference between a plug-in and the actual piece of hardware is how analog gear interacts with other pieces of analog gear yeah. and how that's the one thing that's missing and that you can't emulate and you can't get from digital from plugins well I, I always think about it with the pianos like um, because they always had they've always had these digital pianos mm -hmm. and they, they've gotten pretty good but what they, they it's the same thing where they don't have the like you there's I don't know if they could do it that with all the overtones of all the things that you're playing all interacting with each other right. Like they can sample every note and they can sample like the way the pedals work and they can recreate and I've heard really good ones, but that thing where they all, all those, and my plate reverb is the same way. The, the plate reverb plugins are pretty good, but it can't do, it can't like, it can't know what you're feeding into it and having all those things actually me mixing around on an actual piece of steel. Right. It just, they just interact differently. If you use on an individual thing, if you were just to put a vocal in one and then compare it to an actual plate with just a vocal and you're like yeah I, I, you're it's pretty close it's close enough right. like I wouldn't fight you over that but it's like when it that's the thing when it comes to having how everything works together mm -hmm. and how they integrate I always feel like that I always feel like well you you've recreated that single note really well but you're not recreating this chord or this chord or this right. chord and how the soundboards vibrate and how the notes are all mixing together before they hit the microphone they have that with like a lot of like uh, the digital Mellotron's the same way. They recreated the sounds, but not the electronics of what were in the Mellotron. Right. And for me, as a recording engineer, it was the electronics yeah. that was the mojo I liked about the Mellotron. And then what mic pre you used to record it, you could use like a funky mic pre on it, and that would make it even more interesting sounding. When you just have like a really pure, clean, sampled recording, no matter how perfect a recreation is, it doesn't sound to me like that instrument right. is supposed to sound. So you have a P331. How I do. You, do. How did you work that into your workflow, your setup? Where do you use it? I use it at the uh, just before the analog tape stage of my uh, my two bus rig, and basically it's I mean it's it's a beautiful piece of gear. It's uh, it does tube loading and it's setting. You can do a million settings with it, but I when you first when I was first demoing it, I found a setting I liked, and I I kind of haven't veered from there. Um, so it mostly stays static where where I like it. And I've experimented sometimes I'll turn the loading up a little bit for certain projects that uh, I want to and then I'll back it off on certain things that I think should be cleaner. But um, it's uh, uh, it just gives it that extra little thing. It's the classic thing with uh, any piece of analog gear. As long as the levels are relatively the same, if you have it in and you and then you turn it off mm -hmm. and and it's sometimes hard to do your own blindfold testing. Yeah. But there's ways you can trick yourself to not know right. what A or B is. And uh, th that's a box that if you don't know, if you've got it all even and there's no level change and you switch A to B, A to B blindfold yourself, I always like it better with it on, right. which to me is you can't ask uh, more than that from a piece of gear because there's lots of them. You put them on, and you're like, you kind of dig it. And then you A, B test and it's like, 50 50 sometimes right. whether you like it better or not and that's just not the way it should be so from my cold dead hands take away my p321